Okay, I'd like to welcome on stage Raul Pangam, who's CEO and co-founder of Similti from the USA. Raul was previously with uh, Google, and uh, PayPal is now heading up Similti. Over to you. Thank you. Um, hey, folks, I'm Rahul Pangam, uh, CEO, co-founder of Simility. Spent the last four years uh, building big data analytics-driven uh, fraud detection systems. And now we are a part of PayPal. We were acquired by PayPal late last year. Uh, what I'm going to walk through is you know, we have uh, some of the largest banks, some of the largest uh, sort of payment solutions and merchants using Simility. We have talked to hundreds of uh, folks, right, uh, whether they be current customers or potential customers. And in those conversations, what we have picked up uh, in terms of their need, in terms of their concerns, um, and then what are the early adopters doing, right? What kind of technologies are they embracing? Uh, and this is based on these conversations. I've tried to summarize that on a few slides. Uh, the first half of the conversation is pretty much about what I'm hearing about needs, concerns, challenges, opportunities. And the second one is um, some of the key themes that emerge in the types of solutions that will address those opportunities, needs, and, uh, and concerns. So first, um, you know, whenever we have a conversation about you know, somebody wanting a new fraud detection system, it's usually driven by sort of four secular trends that is causing them to look for a new solution. First is digital first economy. Uh, you know, for a long time, digital, yes, it was a channel, but now it's digital first, which means you have to be ready for a world in which you're not face to face with the customer, and assessing trust is a sort of very different ballgame. Uh, that also leads to um, a global omni channel customer base, right? Uh, transactions coming from an iPhone are very different than an Android, very different than a desktop, very different than a phone. You need to be able to assess all of these and the variations and diversity of the data and be able to make a call. Same with a global customer base, right? Um, uh, what 3DS uh, is, is uh, in Europe in terms of acceptance and, and challenges customers have is very different than US, very different than Asia. And so how do you, you, know, how do you deal with all of this? Uh, the third is data breaches and security. Um, every second, there are 293 records that are breached in the US. These are PII information, credit card information. So you just have to assume we live in a world where every data point about everybody is out there on the black market. So when somebody tells you I am person X and this is my card, you can't just immediately assume that they are the, you know, they, they are the right person. They may just have got that compromised information. And lastly, changing regulations, right? We have GDPR in Europe. Um, uh, you know, we have regulations in India and China where the data should be hosted locally. And that just means fraud detection becomes a very different ballgame um, than how we're traditionally used to doing it in one data center, aggregating all the data, and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of opportunities, you know, because of uh, you know, mobile and sort of various device form factors and so on and so forth, we see customers saying, hey, look, uh, we have a brand new business model, but the fraud detection systems, they're all trying to sort of sell cookie cutter solutions. And it doesn't quite fit my need. Um, you know, whether I'm physical goods, digital goods, or I'm a marketplace, right? Uh, what applies for Uber may not apply for a gaming company. And so the, the, the overriding theme we hear is like, I need something that solves my problem. It's customized to me, personalized to me. Uh, the third is, this is both an opportunity and a, a challenge, right? There is so much data, right? Whether, uh, you know, where, how you're tracking your customers, what kind of feeds you're getting at account opening, login, different pages uh, on different devices. There is so much data available uh, that it's unbelievable what can be done with that. Um, and then from multiple data sources, right? You now have vendors that can provide you social network data. You have vendors that can provide you sort of cross, uh, you know, global geography data. You, can, you have vendors that can provide you behavioral biometrics. You have all this data. How do you convert that into intelligence? I think that's the big question. And the other challenge you have is um, the tools are siloed. They're trying to solve specific problems. You don't get a holistic view of that data and trying to understand your customer across uh, the different touch points and across the different um, uh, you know, customer journey milestones. Um, the other challenge we hear quite often is like legacy solutions are ineffective, right? And fraudsters, it's always a cat and mouse game. This is the last 20 years of evolution of different systems that, uh, that have come on the market, starting with the simplest where, hey, we have simple rules and blacklist, whitelist as sort of the first digital fraud detection systems, which means, hey, look, 
uh, I found somebody post fact to be a fraudster. I'm going to blacklist their address, name, um, card, IP. And when they come next time, um, I'm going to stop them from doing a transaction. That evolved into a linear model saying, hey, look, fraudsters figured out that, hey, they could use a different IP or a different address. Um, and so now we need a combination of variables to decide what is fraud and, and what is good. Uh, and post that, fraudsters also figured out, OK, I can use different IPs, I can use different addresses. So now you had things like device fingerprinting, which came into the play, saying, hey, there's a finite number of devices, so they have to use a single computer. So if we are able to fingerprint the device, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, we now move into a world where we have multi-device usage. I use like six devices on an everyday basis to access my accounts, and I, you know, those get swapped out every year. So, so you know, we have evolved to a point where sort of assuming that one person uses one device doesn't make sense. And then we have the uh, advent of machine learning because we have all this data, and um, we are unable to decide what, what part of that data is most important for fraud detection. So we said, you know what, I'm going to just throw the problem at the machine and let it figure out for me. Well, guess what? It's, it's great, but it also becomes a black box because you're relying on the machine to do things for you. You don't know why it's doing th certain things, and uh, you, know, do you, you don't know the context of some of this, right, in, in, in your business context. And so we talk about this approach called adaptive and clear box, and I'll go into more details. But I think the challenge here is, like, are, we, are the technologies able to keep pace with, with the problem? And so this is, this is the world of a, of a typical uh, customer that we meet, whether it's a bank or a merchant or a payment solution provider. You know, you have all these competing business priorities. You have to meet regulatory needs. You have to reduce fraud and operational costs. You have to improve conversions, enhance customer experience, rapidly innovate, and you have to do it fast. And so now you like, oh, I'm overwhelmed, right? There's all this opportunity, but all this challenge. How do I do it? Um, I would say, like, you know, you just breathe, take a step back, right? How fraudsters operate and what is the core of detecting fraud hasn't changed in five years, hasn't changed in 10 years, hasn't changed in 100 years. There are just two basic concepts you need to understand. One is um, when a customer comes up, are you able to assess they are who they claim to be? And two, are you able to assess their behavior and is it consistent with a trusted behavior or is it consistent with a suspicious behavior? And that's it. There are, the technologies change, the data changes, but the fundamental fact of how you detect fraud remains the same. And for you in this sort of new ecosystem to enable uh, doing those two things, um, uh, what you first need is a platform that is capable of handling the kind of data ingestion and modeling that you need today. And there are four key pillars of this platform. Um, and I won't go into too many details. and happy to talk during the panel about it. But the first pillar is extensive data intelligence. Don't restrict people from uh, getting data in. right? Allow people to have sort of as much and as different kinds of data that can come in and, and enhance fraud intelligence. So if you have chat transcript, that's fine. If you have shopping cart information, that's fine. Don't say, this is my sort of restrictive world and only give me this data, because more data means more intelligence. Secondly, we talked about um, uh, you know, machine learning and, and sort of big data. And the heart of the system is usually the second stage, which is the risk engine. Uh, big data enabled, ML enabled. So can you use machine learning models? Are you able to derive information from that data? Right? And that, that, the, power, the more powerful that engine, the more likely you're going to be successful in meeting the outcome that you have in mind from a fraud detection standpoint. Third is effective data orchestration. Uh, we usually say approve or deny a transaction. That's you know, pain, you know, just having a binary view is, is not great. Uh, customers, there's all shades of gray. So you may want to say, OK, approve a transaction or deny it, or challenge uh, 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 you know, using two-factor authentication, or send it for manual review. And how do you sort of uh, create this more nuanced way of approaching customers is super important. So your platform needs effective data orchestration strategies and decision orchestration strategies. And last but not the least, right? Uh, up until this point, it's all about uh, sort of the, the sort of platform doing stuff. How do you highlight this information to humans that makes sense, right? It, it's all about data visualization, things like link analysis, graph databases, so that when you're post-fact doing investigation, when you're trying to do a deep manual investigation, the data is made available to you in a relevant form, and, and you're able to do um, a sort of very deep and broad investigation. And I think those are the four, four sort of key pillars of uh, an effective fraud detection system.
Um, so moving on, right? Like I mentioned, the, the, the engine, the risk engine is the heart of any fraud detection system. And I think we, are, we have sort of moved, but you know, still continue moving to this world where what I call is like a clear box approach to machine learning. The early, early um, machine learning based systems are kind of a black box, right? Um, uh, you get a decision back saying, hey, look, you should deny this transaction. And on a scale of 1 to 100, the score is like 85. And hence, you should deny the transaction. Well, it was great because it, it sort of gave you a way to look at things that you didn't have before. But as machine learning became more prevalent, people started saying, hey, I need more context about why am I being told to deny this transaction or accept this transaction. And this is where Clearbox approach comes in. It's like, hey, um, give me more context, right? So if the score is 85, here is why it's 85, right? There are like the email ID of the person doing the transaction has six vowels. And if you have more than five vowels in your email ID, uh, you're 95% likely to be a fraudster, right? And, and that kind of context helps you. And this is what we call Clearbox machine learning approach. And I think more and more solutions are moving towards this. Like, don't just tell me what, tell me how and why. Uh, you're, you're suggesting that I make this decision. And I think that's super important. And last one, this is sort of most exciting slide for me. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll spend at least uh, you know, two or three minutes talking about this, is uh, how do you adapt using machine learning? And we are in the sort of very early stages of what I call auto ML. It's a very often used buzzword, uh, largely used by marketing folks, very, you know, very selectively used by data science folks. But this is where um, the future is headed in terms of machine learning, right? At least in the near future, the, you know, and, and the disruptions. And so I'm just going to walk through, right? Um, very high level layman's terms of, you know, how a machine learning workflow is developed as somebody goes through. Uh, building new models, right? So let's say if you're a, a merchant selling shoes online, um, you come to us and say, look, um, five in a thousand transactions I have are fraudulent, and can you help me predict which of those five are going to be fraudulent? I'm going to say, okay, fine. Uh, give me your last three months of data with, uh, with where you have uh, uh, information saying which of these turned out to be fraudulent and which ones are clean, and let's start from there. So once I get that data, I will go through a phase called data preparation, right? Which is essentially two things. I'm trying to make sure that the data is clean and consistent. So for example, um, you know, if 90% of the data has shoe size as an attribute, which is uh, European shoe size, but 10% as US, I need to make sure that either uh, we have another field that says, you know, is this a US or European shoe size, or a way to convert uh, the, the US shoe size to European. Because once that data goes to the models, it sees a variation in that 10% traffic, and it might, it might you know, throw uh, some kind of uh, 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 an error or use that data incorrectly, right? The second thing that happens is, let's say you are um, selling these shoes, and you give us 25 fields about the transaction, um, you know, whether it's price of the shoe, uh, the brand of the shoe, uh, shopping cart, email of the buyer, and so on and so forth. So uh, we take those 25 fields, and create almost 1,000 fields out of it, right? So email can be one field, and you will have uh, variants such as how many vowels in the email. You know, is it a Hotmail account, Yahoo account, and so on and so forth. So that's, again, data prep, which is uh, how can you explode that 25 fields into 1,000 uh, and use that for fraud detection? And then you sort of build models. Um, you know, you can build different kinds of models, um, uh, different techniques, select different features, uh, and then select which model is most relevant in terms of um, giving you uh, a, a more accurate prediction of fraud. Now, this whole process takes anywhere from 10 to 20 weeks. Uh, and there is tremendous human involvement in each step of the way from data scientists and engineers. And AutoML is the process of automating almost as much of that as possible so that within hours, you're able to self-select the features, build the models, keep comparing them, deploy the right model, and then predict, right? And I think, to me, this is the most sort of uh, exciting piece in terms of what the next two years, three years will bring in terms of uh, machine learning and fraud detection. Um, and that's my last slide. Thank you.